Okay, yeah. So, a um, couple of weeks ago, I was going to the medical lab and um, they took a blood sample and, and analyzed it. And uh, there was this amazing new technology, so they said I could get my results over the internet. And uh, what they gave me was actually a sheet uh, where, uh, with a URL where I could log in and, and check my results. And what was on the sheet was a, a small um, screenshot of the, the well-known um, pop-up window where it says, uh, are you, uh, the certificate of the website is invalid, do you want to accept it? And below it was uh, the caption, uh, if you're asked if, the if you want to accept the certificate, please uh, click accept or okay, depending on your browser. So uh, if the medical examiner tells you to accept invalid certificates, maybe the least of your worries are your printers. Um, but still, actually, we think it's a pretty interesting topic because printers uh, print confidential information all the time. And uh, if an attacker is able to bug a printer once and take it over, uh, he can gain continued access to this information. So maybe a little background about me. Uh, I'm working as a security researcher and penetration tester for the Austrian company Second Salt. Uh, we do some kind of stuff like penetration testing and um, consulting for organizational security stuff, ISO 27001 and things like that. Um, I'm not going to bore you really with this slide, so let's get straight to the talk. Um, what is the talk about at all? So at first, we're going to have a look why are printers interesting at all to an attacker? So what can an attacker gain by attacking the printers? Um, then we're going to show you uh, once you have downloaded uh, the firmware of a printer, and luckily quite a number of firmwares for printers are uh, online freely available, so most of those vendors have uh, a web page where you can download the firmware. So once you have downloaded the firmware, what can you do with it and how to extract it and analyze it and get to the data that is actually behind the firmware. Um, then we are going to show you uh, a zero-day vulnerability this is the first time this vulnerability um, is disclosed. Actually, we strongly believe in responsible disclosure, so of course we let the vendor know it. And uh, Xerox was really cool about it. Uh, they had one of the most professional uh, security incident response uh, we've ever saw. Uh, and uh, they actually even saw the slides and allowed us to present them, so that's really cool. Um, after those vulnerabilities, um, I'm going to show you some further analysis. And uh, actually, in our lab, we succeeded in emulating a printer using QEMO. And uh, we were able to do some black box fuzzing testing uh, with a printer where you do not own the actual hardware, but which just runs in the emulator. Finally, we'll do some conclusions. Okay. So why are, interest, uh, are printers interesting to attackers at all? Um, printers have some obvious disadvantages. So the first thing is printers are rarely connected to the internet. So mostly you have to be on the local network uh, to get access to the printers. But the theme of this uh, deep sec is, uh, is this, uh, industrial espionage. And uh, for someone who directly targeted attacks uh, a company, how hard can it get to, uh, how hard can it be to get access to the local area network? So all he has to do is uh, like uh, put on some blueware and uh, a, a toolbox and say, okay, there is uh, the closet uh, dripping in the fourth floor and I'm here to repair that and somewhere on the way, uh, he will definitely find a conference room where he can uh, plug in his laptop. Actually, probably nowadays, it's not even uh, strange if uh, the, the plumber has a laptop with him, because everything, IT is everywhere nowadays. And uh, even so, if you have some uh, printer firmware analy uh, analyzed and uh, you do some Google search, for words that uh, come up in the, in the firmware. Uh, it's really surprising how many printers actually are connected to the internet. So for almost all brands of printers uh, we analyzed, we also found printers that were 
connected directly to the internet and that Google, where Google found the, um, the administrative interface. Um, the second thing, uh, which is somewhat of a disadvantage for an attacker, is that discovering vulnerabilities uh, in printers is more or less hard work, uh, or so it seems. So the problem for an attacker is that in many cases uh, he, or formerly, he used to own, uh, he used to have to own the hardware. And some of these printers can be pretty expensive. So you can pay up to 5,000 euros for a single piece of printer if it's a large one. And buying such a printer just to find vulnerabilities and attack your target is not very feasible. So um, for this also, firmware analysis is good because you don't need to own the printer, the hardware, uh, to be able to do security analysis. On the other hand, there are also quite a number of advantages that makes it easier for an attacker uh, to own the printers. The first one is printers uh, do not have virus scanners installed. So uh, whatever you, vulnerability you find, uh, normally you can just take your usual shell code from Metasploit and no one is going to stop you from ejecting it if you found uh, a buffer overflow. Um, the second thing is the printers are not covered by the patch management process uh, in many companies. Um, I don't know, has any one of you patched a printer in the last six months? Yeah, we have, we have two. Um, and uh, was this for security reasons or uh, just because something was not working? Security? No. Okay. So, yeah. If someone is patching his printers, mostly it's because uh, the support hotlines uh, tell them they have to patch them in order to get some stuff working. Um, so if you succeed in finding a vulnerability in a printer, chances are it's going to work over years because unless something is broken, nobody's going to install the manufacturer updates. Another thing is many com companies use a, a single brand for all their printers. So uh, companies usually tend to have tons of printers, uh, at least one in each, um, in each, um, uh, in each, um, building stage. Um, and uh, so if you find a single vulnerability in one printer they use, chances are you can use the same vulnerabilities on most of the other printers. Uh, also, confidential information is sent to printers all the time. Uh, for some reasons, many people even believe that information on paper is more secure than information stored digitally, which actually is true in some cases. But if your printer uh, is, has been owned by an attacker, that doesn't count any longer and it's uh, intercepted on the way to the printer. Um, yeah, like I said, owning and bugging a printer guarantees continued access to company information. Uh, and also even uh, information that was printed uh, before the attacker was able to, to take over the printer. Uh, pretty much all printers or all larger printers nowadays have hard disks in them where they temporarily store information if it's too large for the memory. Um, and you would probably be able to get this information from the hard disk even if it was printed some weeks or months before uh, the actual attack. Okay, so regarding firmware, there are two main attack vectors uh, regarding printers. The first attack vector is to backdoor the firmware. So for this, you just modify the firmware and uh, inject malicious code. So uh, you download the firmware, uh, extract it, plant some new binaries or plant some new code, uh, and get the administrator to install the backdoor firmware, which is pretty hard. You have to be pretty close to the administrator to get him to install the backdoor firmware. Also, uh, many vendors nowadays digitally sign their firmware upgrades. So if it's digitally signed, uh, this is uh, really hard to, to get uh, rid of this uh, signature check. On the other hand, it's pretty easy to plant the exploit code um, and the, the backdooring of the firmware itself is not that hard. So the second attack vector is to find uh, a vulnerability in a printer that can be exploited either locally 
or uh, over the network. Printers nowadays have so many network connections open, so there are so many ways to access a printer. Pretty much all of them have a web interface, uh, but many of them also have a SMB uh, server running on them where people can just copy over a normal uh, network, share their files, and they are printed. Um, and so in many cases, it's, it's not that hard to find a vulnerability that can be uh, exploited over the network. So the disadvantage is, of course, you need to find that vulnerability. And uh, if you look for vulnerabilities in printers, uh, you are in many cases not finding very much, especially not well-hidden vulnerabilities, uh, because most of those vulnerabilities actually have been found uh, through the web interface, uh, where an attacker uh, has succeeded in finding some kind of command injection into the printer. Uh, through the web interface and use this access to the printer to find further vulnerabilities. So the focus of this talk is mainly on attack vector number two. So how to use the firmware uh, to find vulnerabilities uh, in printers. Using the firmware makes it a lot easier to, to find such vulnerabilities. The firmware also, as I already said, is uh, very often available through a web page and um, as we will see in later slides, uh, many of these firmwares can be extracted and uh, allow access to the file system of the printer. So as I said, nowadays most printers have hard disks, so uh, actually there are quite a number of printers which are running on Linux, um, so it's rather easy. So in some instances, the printer can even be emulated uh, and uh, all the binaries that are on there can be emulated and checked for vulnerabilities using fuzzing or, or, or gray box techniques. Um, and the main advantage of using the firmware is that you don't have to own the hardware. So you can just, if you know some companies using this or that printer, just go to the vendor page, download the firmware, uh, no need to go uh, to some store and buy the actual printer. So part of the research still can be used for attack vector number one, two. Uh, for example, uh, we will see in the later slides how those uh, images can be extracted, or how some of these images can be extracted. And using the extracted uh, firmware images, it's a lot easier to plant malicious code in there. Okay, so next section will be, I downloaded the firmware of a printer, what now? Um, well, the firmware contains an image of the printer's hard, uh, hard disk uh, as well as uh, images for some kind of other memory which is in the printer. Uh, printers very seldomly consist of only one component. So uh, what you have from vendors is you get one firmware, uh, but in fact this is just a packed file which contains firmwares for all these components. So you have uh, a firmware for uh, the fax machine that is in the printer. You have a firmware uh, that is for the, uh, for, the, for the mailbox, which might be in the printer. And you have the main firmware, which runs the printer in itself. So uh, if you can gain access to the file system, um, what can you do with this? So for example, there are lots of configuration files which you could uh, try to, to analyze and see if there are any vulnerabilities. Um, as I said, most printers have web scripts or web interfaces. Those web interfaces uh, can be analyzed. You have the, or you even might have the web interface in some scripting language like PHP uh, where you can see the actual source code and it's a lot easier to find those vulnerabilities through the source code than through black box mechanisms. Um, also, you can look for default or support accounts. There's quite a number of default accounts actually we found in firmware. So some, um, some support accounts where an administrator may, might uh, log in uh, and some vendor default passwords that is set uh, in all the printers and you can use that, for example, to log in through the console. Um, and again, you can further investigate vulnerabilities by emulating the processor architecture and running the binaries in an emulator. So the first firmware image I'm going to show you is the one of the Xerox Work Center. Um, 
this printer actually is running on uh, Linux. And uh, when you download the firmware, uh, it's probably pretty small, but you don't need to read that. That's just the hex editor. Uh, what you see, it's actually a PostScript files. Most printer vendors do that, that they pack all the firmware in some kind of PostScript file or printer job language file, uh, and this is the one file that is sent to the printer to upgrade the firmware. Uh, after the initial PostScript header, you have an embedded file, and um, you find all these kinds of magic numbers, like for example, 1F8B is a very common uh, magic number, which we'll see uh, on the next slides. So also interesting, maybe for attack vector number one, is that here it says uh, extraction criteria upgrade extract.sh uh, with a path. So this is actually just uh, obviously just some shell script which runs. So an attacker which is able to, to plant some backdoor firmware might be able to change uh, to change the command here and run some malicious code. However, as you can see here, uh, there is a signature. So uh, the firmware upgrade is digital designed, though since we do not actually own the printer hardware, uh, we were not able to find out if the complete file is signed or if just the, um, the compressed uh, actual firmware upgrade, which starts below here after the postscript header, uh, is signs uh, only. So when you are analyzing um, firmware or some unknown file format in general, uh, magic numbers are always really useful. Uh, there are quite a number of magic numbers and especially since most of these firmware images are compressed, uh, those are especially interesting. And most most compression formats have their own magic numbers. So for example, uh, gzip has 1f8b, bzip has uh, 42.5a, uh, there's a magic number for compress, those are the dot .set um, archives, zip has a magic number, and also setleap. Uh, so since on the last slide we saw the magic number was 1f8b, so obviously it's just a gzip file. Uh, with a postscript header, the Xerox firmware image. Okay, so um, this actually worked. We just had to um, get rid of the postscript header uh, up to the magic number and use gzip to uh, uncompress the Xerox image. And again, we saw uh, a new file and again with a magic number called US tar which indicates that it's nothing but a tar file, which can be extracted again. And in this tar file, there were um, all types of different firmwares. For example, you have a bootloader, you have the bootstrap code, you have uh, the firmware for the fax machine that is in the printer. And the most interesting and by far the largest file uh, with 96 megabytes uh, is here is ECN and some number. Uh, and if you extract that file, uh, you find the complete file system of the printer. You can see that it's running Linux, which actually isn't documented anywhere for some reason. Um, and you have everything you could need. You have the boot directory, you have the, the binaries directory, uh, you have all the scripts that run when the printer is booted. Um, you even have uh, the etc shadow file with uh, the root password, which seems to be the same on all uh, Xerox machines of this uh, series. Uh, due to, to time constraints, we were not able to actually crack this, but it should not be too much of a problem. So if you have a couple of weeks, uh, you can easily probably crack the root password uh, and get root access on all of these Xerox machines. Additionally, this is also really small, but it's uh, a screenshot of the uh, web interface. And you can see below here quite a number of PHP files. So uh, the web interface for the Xerox printer is written actually in PHP. Um, and some libraries which are loaded into, into the Apache. It runs under Apache. Uh, so 
this is nothing but actually a normal PC. Even the architecture, it's an uh, i386 machine, so uh, nothing uncommon about that. So we'll have a look at two other firmware images, which are a little bit harder to extract. Uh, for example, we have uh, we analyzed one printer from Samsung. Um, the first problem is that when you download the um, firmware image, you get just an executable, so just an EXE file. Uh, and if you start the EXE file, it will ask you for the IP address of the printer and will try to online upgrade the printer. So this is pretty trivial to find the actual firmware. Uh, using FileMon or some similar software that shows what disk activity uh, is going on from some program. Uh, we found that the executable creates the file CLX, some number .hd, which is uh, the hardware content of the printer. This file, again, has uh, a similar header. This time it's not a PostScript file, but a uh, PYGL uh, file, so which is short for printer job language, uh, and it's something proprietary by Samsung, uh, how they uh, communicate with their printers. So, again, this is an unknown file format, and uh, what we found out that those four bytes you're seeing here uh, seem very much like an offset, uh, or, or actually a length. So what this is, is the length of the file that follows. So um, followed by file name. So uh, through this information, we were able to extract again all the files that were in the, in the firmware. Uh, again, different firmwares for different components. You have uh, lily, yx.bin, uh, you have some ROM files, some more bin files, which are, again, firmware for different components of the printers. Um, the largest file by far is Lily VX bin, and um, if you have a look at the contents, uh, unfortunately this time there is no magic number, uh, and the contents doesn't seem to make uh, a lot of sense, it's just gibberish. Um, so. What we were thinking was that either it is encrypted or it is compressed. So the easiest way to find out which of both it is is um, to get a, frequen a byte frequency uh, because if the image is encrypted, the byte frequency should be pretty equal. So there shouldn't be some kind of changes in byte frequency over bytes. Uh, what we did get was uh, this curve, so obviously uh, it is not a straight line like you would expect if uh, it was encrypted and it seems to be compressed. So this is actually the typical byte frequency that you can find uh, when you see something that is uh, encrypted by some Huffman algorithm. You will also have, uh, you will always have these spikes here. Uh, and if you see something like that in byte frequency, it's very, very likely that it's compressed using some Huffman algorithm. And uh, one small hint, Zlib uh, is very, very common in firmware because it's available for almost all architectures uh, and is freely available. So Zlib is very common and uh, the first guess would be that it's Zlib. So unfortunately, Zlib has a number of different options. So uh, it can have different block sizes. It can have different window sizes. Uh, that this is some really trivial Perl script, uh, which does nothing but check out different window sizes and different block sizes and also uh, different offsets. So maybe this has some uh, not compressed header. Uh, and the script skips the first byte, then it skips the second byte, then it skips the third byte, and so on to find out if anything is uh, compressed with Zlib in the file. Actually, this worked, and um, in all the firmwares where this worked, the window size was 15 and the block size was uh, 1024. Uh, so this seems to be really common, and uh, this would be the first guess. Um, 
as I said, this worked to extract the firmware image. Um, the problem with this firmware image, however, was that uh, there is this uh, real-time operating system by Wind River uh, called VxWorks, um, and there is practically no information or documentation about this uh, operating system available. Uh, so while we were able to actually get to the code, uh, they seem to use ELF binaries, so using reverse engineering uh, techniques, it would have been able, uh, we would probably have been able uh, to see what the firmware does, but uh, lacking experience with VxWorks, that's how far we got. Uh, what else we did find with the Samsung printer was that at the end of, at the very end of the firmware image, uh, there was another file which didn't have a name, which was uh, an HTML file, large HTML file, and uh, a Java archive, uh, which seems to be, or which is the web interface of the printer. And it actually, it was able to run the web interface uh, of the printer on a normal machine. Um, and since the uh, Java archive is, is executed on the client computer, not on the uh, printer anyway with uh, all clients. So um, for legal reasons, we did not decompile the Java file, uh, but an attacker, uh, of course, would not be hindered by any legal reasons. Uh, so he would probably analyze the Java file and have a look what it does. What we did find out uh, through a simple network sniffer was that the char file does communicate over SNMP with the printer and all the settings are just set over SNMP. Of course, this is all completely unencrypted and if the community string can be uh, sniffed by an attacker, which is also a default community string, uh, he can do pretty much anything. Uh, even upload files to the printer, which are then uh, printed. So maybe we do not own the hardware, and we, in this case, we were not able to emulate it. But uh, maybe there are also some vulnerabilities where an attacker can upload uh, corrupted files. Okay, and then the last firmware image with, uh, in which we had a look was uh, an HP machine, CM8000, which is a really interesting printer because it's running on uh, Windows XP embedded, um, which you can see on the first glance if you have to download the firmware because it's 1.3 uh, gigabyte big. So that's really huge. It took, it took eternally to download just the firmware. Um, if you have a look again at the firmware interface, and this was uh, quite hard from a hex editor to open the 1.3 gigabyte file, uh, you see um, an, uh, a FAT header below here, so it's just a FAT file system which contains a number of files. Uh, it contains some PAC files, uh, some EFI files, one of those pack files is probably Windows XP because it's 1.1 gigabyte large. Um, and uh, what is really interesting about this printer is that it is compliant to the UEFI standard or specification. This is short for Unified Extensible Firmware Specification uh, that has been released by uh, Intel. And uh, this is actually some good progress because uh, they are trying to make a standard for how firmware is installed onto embedded devices. Uh, and also they specify how those binary works. Uh, the specification is freely available from their website, tianocore.org. Um, unfortunately, it's really huge, like uh, 2,000 pages or something like that. Um, but what is also amazing about the UEFI specification is that Intel provides a complete open source implementation, uh, also at tianacore.org, uh, and a development kit, EFI development kit. And this EFI development kit uh, contains an emulator for .efi files. So all those EFI files, you can see here, are nothing but uh, executables. Uh, 
Uh, they are very similar to Excel or DLL files. They also use the PE file format um, and uh, using the emulator, uh, this binary here called packdump.efi can run. So packdump.efi from the name really sounds like it might be able to extract all those uh, pack files that can be found in the firmware. So using the emulator, which is a little hard to build uh, because it's only available in source code, there are no binaries and it requires a special version of uh, Visual Studio to get running. Um, but once you have it compiled, it runs really nice and you can start it. Uh, you have different uh, like hard disks in here and uh, you, can, you can just run the EF uh, I files in the emulator and calling packdump EFI on one of those pack files shows you exactly the file offset uh, and all the items pack files seem to be, they are proprietary formats uh, from HP um, and they contain different kinds of files and packdump shows you the offsets and the sizes, <coughs> sorry. Um, of all the parts in the file. So using the information from packdump again, we were able to extract the large pack file and what was in there were uh, SDI files. And SDI again is short for system development image uh, and is uh, nothing but an image format specified by Microsoft, which is used for embedded devices uh, and also for the, for the boot disk. So with the Windows Embedded Tools, there is a utility Microsoft provides called SDI Manager.wsf, uh, and you can call this with the slash dump uh, commands to get, uh, again, to see what parts are in the SDI file and extract those parts. And the part in turn, now finally we're getting somewhere, is the NTFS image of the final files sorry, file system of the printer. So it's just like normal Windows XP, you have your documents and settings directory, you have your program files, you have your Windows directory, uh, you have of course the SAM files containing the default accounts you can find in there um, and things like that. Okay, so um, that's it for how to extract uh, firmware images. Those were just three examples we more or less randomly took. We also had a look at quite a number of different printers. Uh, and in the end, it's mostly the same for all these printers. Unfortunately, uh, like the Samsung printer, many of those run pretty obscure operating systems, uh, real-time operating systems with very little uh, documentation is available, like Lynx, for example, which is also similar to VxWorks. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is, um, is our two zero-day vulnerabilities we discovered in the Xerox Work Center. They're actually not very spectacular. They're just vulnerabilities uh, we found in the web interface. Our main focus was not to discover vulnerabilities uh, in the printers, but rather how to analyze the printers. But those were so obvious that we couldn't really help uh, finding them. And again, Xerox was really cool about this and had one of the most professional, definitely, uh, incident responses that we've ever come across. So the first vulnerability is an authentication circumvention vulnerabilities. Oh, what I forgot to mention, by the way, uh, Xerox uh, should have released by now a patch for these vulnerabilities. So they are going to upload it to their web page. And if you're using this printer, you can go to xerox.com uh, and download the patch and install it on your printer, which hopefully uh, you do. So um, in order to use the Xerox Work Center web interface, uh, there are some pages which are available to the public. And most of the web pages, or the most interesting, at least for an attacker, uh, are protected by authentication. So uh, like the root account for the, for the web interface is called SA for system administrator. 
and uh, in order to do real stuff and change settings on the printer, you need to be locked in as SA. So now how Xerox enforces this authentication is if you are not authenticated and they check this by a cookie, uh, they redirect you to the login page. And the way they do it in PHP is they call the header file, uh, the header call, uh, with a um, location argument. And uh, what this does is it sends a, a redirect header with the location, but this is copied from the, from the PHP documentation. What is really vital is the exit call afterwards, because if you do not call exit after the header, uh, the function doesn't really uh, influence the, the, the calls uh, of the script, but rather just changes the header and the rest of the script runs anyway. So um, you really, after calling header, you should really call the exit uh, because otherwise the rest of the script still runs. Um, the funny thing is if a user is locked in, but not system administrator, exit is called. If the user is not locked in at all, it is not called. So it's better in this case to be not locked in at all than being locked in as anyone um, on the system. So this can really easily be exploited, for example, with the burp proxy. Uh, all you have to do is in the response header, uh, change the HTTP 11302 found, uh, which redirects the browser to HTTP 101.200 uh, OK. Uh, and from now on, you can just use the web page uh, in your browser and uh, you will see the same as if you were authenticated. Actually, you are authenticated and you can do uh, all the changes on the settings and whatever you prefer. Um, we're fully aware that this kind of vulnerability uh, can always be found. So there is an Austrian standard if you're interested, A7700. Uh, which is a standard for how to write secure web applications. And uh, you can also certify a web application after this standard. It's based on the OVASP guide. Uh, and in such a review, such a vulnerability would definitely found, be found. Um, the next vulnerability or the second vulnerability we discovered was really fun because it was, it seems like an um, and deliberately placed backdoor. So if you see this directory listing here, does any file strike you as strange? There you have the file, you got it.php, which is something we did not plant there, but is actually in the original uh, Xerox firmware uh, image. So what this script does is, um, the printer has some mailbox uh, functionality, and uh, if you want to access a mailbox of a user, uh, it can be protected using a password. So normally, if you want to see the mailbox, you have to know the password. However, if you call the script and give it the uh, folder name of the mailbox you want to see as an argument, it sets the right cookie uh, in order to give you authentication. So there can't be uh, a deep sec talk without a lolcat, so I just had to place that there. Okay, so, so much for the Xerox vulnerabilities. Um, we will definitely post an advisory afterwards, but uh, we wanted to wait until the talk. So, now uh, to the uh, final part of the presentation, emulating a printer. Um, in case of the Xerox Work Center printer, uh, we actually have the complete file system, including uh, the Linux kernel and everything we need to get the thing running in an emulator. So if we were able to start the system or to emulate the system, we could do black or uh, a lot more in-depth testing than if uh, than uh, if we only have the firmware image, and we do not need to own the printer hardware for that. So as an emulator, we chose QEMU because it supports many architectures, uh, though, as I said, with Xerox, this is not even required. You could probably also use VMware uh, to emulate this printer because it runs on x86. 
So there's some small preparation work required to get it running. Uh, first, you need to create create an image. Uh, mount, format it as X3 file system, mount it on loop pack, copy the file system onto the image. Now, one minor problem is that slash def is empty. Of course, the devices are not there in the image. So um, in order to boot it, you need at least uh, def null and def console. Uh, and those two devices can be easily created using make not. Uh, one problem that really cost us a lot of time was uh, when initially we were booting uh, the image, we always got an error message, could not open initial console. And uh, after some long hours of searching, we found out that the symbolic links for the libraries are not correct in the, in the firmware image. So you need to run ldconfig uh, in order to make sure the symbolic links to the libraries are correctly created. Now, after you did this, you can just call QMU with the right arguments. You need to give it the kernel, uh, which is on the file system. You need to give it um, the image as primary hard disk, and you can uh, you need to say what is the root file system, and this really works like a charm. You can start the printer in the emulator. Uh, as I said, we were not able to crack the root password quickly, so we just modified the shadow file on the image. Uh, and change the root password. So using our known root password, we could easily log in. And pretty much you can use this printer just like the normal printer. It probably will never pr actually print stuff, uh, but apart from that, you can do uh, most of the things you could do with the real printer. Okay, so some further results. Um, by editing some sim links, we even were able to get uh, the web interface running. And uh, it did have some problems because there is, uh, in most embedded devices, uh, something called non-volatile RAM. Uh, this is uh, a memory where the uh, embedded device stores all its settings. Um, and you would need a copy of this uh, non-volatile RAM uh, to get access to the settings. And if you have a printer, you can easily copy uh, this part of the memory and use it in your emulator. So um, in some instances, it might be better not to emulate the complete system, but rather only uh, individual binaries. This is no longer from the Xerox printer, but rather instead from uh, actually a, a Soho uh, router. Uh, which I have at home, which uh, crashes if you give it a URL, which is longer than 10,000 characters. So we thought we'd have a look at that. Um, and using QMU, you can just call the binary and there is this minus G uh, command, which uh, you add a port to and uh, QMU starts a GDP server. Uh, which can be used to uh, debug the binary. Uh, so this is a lot easier than uh, getting cross-compiling uh, GDB to the embedded system. And uh, instead, you can just use the minus G uh, command of GDP uh, or of QM. Um, OK, so then you start uh, in, you start the HTTP server, uh, you tell, GDP to connect to localhost port 1234, which is where the GDP server is running. And you can do all your standard techniques to analyze vulnerabilities in GDP that you normally use. So you can have a look at the registers. In this case, this is the stack pointer. This is the uh, program counter. Uh, we were not able to actually uh, override the instruction pointer, but it seems it was uh, like a one-off vulnerability where you could crash the router or you could crash rather the web interface of the router, but do not uh, inject any actual code. But still, you can have a look at the stack. What does the stack look like on the emulated binary? And you can really comfortably uh, analyze vulnerabilities uh, that would be otherwise really hard to analyze can also disassemble in GDP, just like uh, you would 
uh, call it directly and it wouldn't be emulated. Okay, so finally some conclusion. Uh, what we saw that printers are just normal computers nowadays. They have hard disks, they have all the stuff your typical server or client has. They also have the same types of vulnerabilities, like uh, you wouldn't expect uh, a vulnerability uh, in a PHP script in a printer, but they actually do have these kind of vulnerabilities. And uh, emulation of firmware can be used to perform this kind of analysis on embedded systems, even if you do not own the actual hardware, and QEMU is really a great tool. All right, that's it, thanks. Any questions? If you have a question, would you raise your hand so I could bring the microphone to you for this being taped? No questions at all. Um, we're not yet running out of time. There's still three minutes left. Nobody has a question? Um, so did you personally ever run across something that stroke you as odd when analyzing this, these print of firmware, like a specific company that, does, that, does, that approaches these issues quite differently? Um. I mean, we did find some some strange uh, um, default accounts, um, but lacking lacking the hardware, we couldn't try them out where they actually work. Um, so, but other than this, no. The the problem is, uh, I really like the UEFI specification because it's a standard and uh, things have worked uh, are supposed to be similar across devices. And nowadays, all embedded devices just different, and they have a different way of packing their firmware. They have a different way of how the firmware is actually transported from the, the system of the administrator to the embedded device. So such a specification would be neat for an attacker, unfortunately. Let's see. Um, still no more other questions. In that case, thank you, Daniel. Thanks.